is StoryCraft, A Way with Words, the first in our series of six conversations with Vermont artists, writers, and media makers about the art, work, and practice of storytelling. This is presented by Burlington Writers Workshop and RETN. And we're going to be speaking tonight about the process of writing. It's a medium all its own, but it's also the basis for many different kinds of storytelling. And it takes an awful lot of work and craft. And I'm really excited tonight to be joined by Jensen Beach and Karen McCadden, two wonderful writers who I've had real, a really exciting time getting to know them and their work in the last month or two. Jensen Beach is the author of the forthcoming Swallowed by the Cold, as well as a previous collection of stories for Out of the Heart Proceed. His fiction has appeared or soon will appear in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, A Public Space, and online at Tin House, American Short Fiction, and N Plus One. He teaches in the BFA program at Johnson State College, where he's a fiction editor at Green Mountains Review. And he lives in Jericho, Vermont, with his family. Hi, Jensen. Welcome. Thank you. And Karen McCadden is the author of Landscaped with Plywood Silhouettes, winner of the 2013 New Issue Poetry Prize and the 2015 Vermont Book Award. She has received fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Vermont Studio Center, the Frost Place, the Sustainable Arts Foundation, the Vermont Art Council, the Vermont Arts Endowment Fund. And her poems have appeared at Best American Poetry, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, Verse Daily, and in such journals as American Poetry Review, The Collagist, Green Mountains Review, and Rattle, among others. Whew, I think I need some water. Karen is a graduate of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College and is currently a teacher at Montpelier High School. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. It's really great to have you guys here. And I'm going to ask you a probably kind of silly question to get started, but why do you write? Why is writing the medium of choice for you? Well, the money, right? That was the, oh, that's obviously, the yeah, the money. <laughs> right. That goes without saying, right? Right. Yeah, yeah it's right. always the money yeah. and the blazers. Yeah. And the blazers, yeah. yes, it's the fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this this morning that um, that it's a hard question because it's kind of like if you're a runner, people say, "Well, why do you run?" You're like, "Well, I run because I have to." You know, I run because I feel like I have to, but at some point you tried it and you liked it and then you kept doing it, right? When you run, running feels good. And I was thinking about how in many ways writing for me is just as simple as I like the way my brain feels when I'm creating something. I like feeling that mix between logic and illogic and, and thinking about the world in ways that are less precise. Mm -hmm. Even though the writing has to be precise, I like that feeling of thinking about the world um, through kind of a fuzzy lens, if that makes sense. It just feels good. Feels good. I love mm -hmm. that. That's yeah. great. How about you, Jessica? Yeah, that, I, I think that's more or less true for me, too. It just it feels nice. I like, I like how it feels to put a sentence together and make a story and put it in a book. It feels good. Um, when I was younger, I, I was more interested in visual arts. I like photography and painting and these kinds of things. And I, I'd always liked writing, reading and writing, and so it was just sort of a natural extension for me, I think, to move into to writing things, mostly really bad poetry. Um, me too. Right? <laughs> We've all been through that phase. Yeah. I think it lasts from 17 until about like 18 and a half or so. Um, it's a really short phase. Yeah, it's really yeah, short. The and then everything you write is really good. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> now, I think, and then I was like in my 20s and I started reading short fiction and just fell in love with what it felt like to read it and then started to write really, really bad stories, a phase I, I hope I'm out of but, pro but doubt that I am. And um, it, yeah, it's just, it feels good. There's no, yeah, I guess that's really the best answer. It just feels nice. And you have to have the opportunity to do it. Like someone has to say, hey, write a story or yeah. here's an opportunity to write a poem or here's a book of did you know that writing could look like this? I remember an early experience yeah. where all the poems I read in school were of a different era, hmm. and they were beautiful, and I loved them, but then when I realized what was being written in my time, it was even more exciting. So the exposure to what's being written, I think, also helps people know what they can do. Mm -hmm. And did you both start writing when you were students? I did, badly. 
Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, that's seventeen. The visual art thing too. I did that too. Yeah. You did, yeah. yeah. The, a lot. I think a lot of writers do 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 that. It's it's mm. it's an interesting thing. I've I've never been big on like writing as a a mode of self-expression. That part of it isn't that important to me, though. Certainly, there's some element to it, and I think that must be true. But now that I'm thinking about it, that that must have been kind of central to my own artistic development in that. If I'm making visual art and then also writing, I mean, there's something in there that wanted to come out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't cared to interrogate it too closely, but um, yeah. It, 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 I like what you say, too, about finding writers that are doing things that excite you. That's, that was true for me, too. I mean, I've always liked English class, even in eighth grade um, and, mm. and more. My mom was a high school English teacher, and reading and that kind of thing is always important. But yeah, then just finding writers that are doing things, and you think, like, oh my god, that's a thing you could actually try and it's really it's really fun and the thing about self-expression I've been thinking a little bit about how writing so also like I don't necessarily do it to feel better or find out about my feelings but I so like that self-expression thing isn't really that important to me but feeling like a journalist is important to me and I think it's yeah. funny to think about like the poet and the short story writer as journalists because we're not telling the truth most of the time you know but we're looking at the world and like well how does the world work and how yeah. can I package it in a way that feels true, you know. So you're that's collecting stuff that you see and repackaging it. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. How do you think that that affects your approach to writing? It, with this idea of like the actual technical yeah. writing, if you're trying to represent something about the world, but going through your filters. I, I mean, I look at the world for things. You know, I think of. Of like we wear wear Velcro suits, you know that you see something and it sort of sticks to you, and you're like, oh, I'm going to use that, and that you look at things. I don't know when you're living your life, like if you look for things. Oh that, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're like oh, that's I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to take it. Do you file? Do you literally write it down and file it away somewhere when you come when you see something like that, or do you just sometimes. stick it in your brain? Yeah, you sometimes. The, sometimes I do write I write things down. Right. I have like endless drafts in my e in my email inbox of like funny things that have happened to me or things that my kids say you or whatever. Yourself? I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a really <laughs> annoying habit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I do do that. Yeah. So That's some good. if you one day accidentally sent those drafts like uh, reply, you know, I'd be, reply more, all I'd be mortified. <laughs> So um, the other thing that's obvious from your amazing bios is that you publish, and you have families, and you have work, and you do lots of different mm. things. <laughs> um, being here is, a, is an accomplishment in itself, considering how much you have going on on your plate. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get back to writing when you're, when you're juggling these different modes of interacting with the world. Yeah, that's hard. Uh, you don't? Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's not, that's not a hopeful answer. I shouldn't say that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not actually as disciplined a writer as I think I should be. That's something that I kind of beat myself up about a lot. I don't, I'm not an everyday kind of a writer. I don't sit, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go work out and then write for two hours before classes. I juggle kids stuff and teaching and prep and all of that. And I just squeeze it in when I can. And it, I think ultimately for me, the, the pleasure of writing is so great that I enjoy sitting down and finding 20 minutes here and there. And I'm not an everyday writer by any stretch of the imagination. I do a lot of translation work, and that I find to be generative for my own writing, too. Mm. And teaching and all the reading I do during the semester, of course, helps. And, and so it's, it's just a matter of kind of piecemeal, like putting things together and finding time and, and writing when I can. Um, slowly. <laughs> do you have a place that you write? Like, do you have an office or and do you find like writing in one spot works better or do you, how do you move around? I know like I get a lot done at Panera every once in a while. Like if I get out, I go to a coffee shop or something. <laughs> I sometimes write, this is a, a confession maybe, I sometimes write in my classroom. I, I lock the door and I hide. <laughs> That's awesome. um, sometimes <laughs> around the corner I have a little spot and my kids sometimes know like oh she's probably hiding around the corner if I do a special knock she'll open the door oh. and I don't do it very often but um, I find that like all the work I need to do for planning teaching I've been teaching for a really long time mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of materials and so it's not the materials that need creating it's the thinking about how I'm going to teach what I'm teaching so I'll do my classroom planning in the car while I'm driving while yeah. I'm cooking dinner like I can't write at those times but I can think Mm. Right, so, or, or like driving, I write and plan while I'm driving sometimes in my head. Um, but it's a lot mm. of multitasking. For sure. and, and then you have to separate the business of promoting your writing 
like this yeah. um, from the process. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot. I have an office at home that is also a guest room that <clears throat> is often filled with people <laughs> 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 that they take from, they take the space from me. I've I had to learn to write um, kind of in weird spaces. My kids are much younger than than Karen's are and. Um, so I've had to learn. I wrote the first draft of the first story in this book sitting on the couch while my kids were watching a movie um, over Christmas break when I was in grad school. Wow. <laughs> uh, the first draft was terrible. I had needed quiet, a quiet space to, to work through it. But, yeah. um, and I, I still will write with noise and people around. I've, I'm not a very, I don't like writing in public. I've never been able to do that. Um, like go to a coffee shop or whatever. I yeah. wish I could because I would be much more disciplined. There's no Facebook, you know. I'd be like mm -hmm. ready to go. Yeah. But um, yeah, I tend to write at home on my couch. Sometimes at work, not very too. often. Yeah. I have offices that I fill with things and then I don't use them anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and spend a minute being self righteous that everybody should not put things on that desk that I never sit at. <laughs> and then um, write on the couch. Yeah. Among my kids, so I started oh, yeah. this book. My son was five, so they like uh, he was little when I started this, and I would put um, noise canceling like construct construction worker headphones on. Oh, that's smart. Oh yeah, the right. Big, the big like guy. they yeah. think yeah. I'm just listening to music, but I'm just listening to nothing. <laughs> and then awesome. my kids are playing and watching movies and stuff, but I'm just like, <laughs> they're like so mommy's good. listening to music. Yeah, so. she's yeah. fine. She's with us. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really good. incredible. And I got a new <laughs> pair of headphones for Christmas because that's my new office is the headphones. The headphones are uh, yeah, I love that. I love you can have like a t-shirt, yeah. the headphones is my office. Yeah. It's really nice. It's a good them. idea because then you it can is. be with your family. Yeah. It is. You know, yeah. and ignore them. <laughs> 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 it's just really important. <laughs> <laughs> Writers make excellent parents. Right. It's, it's, but they know you're true. there. Yeah. They know you're right. there. Right? Just look up and smile <laughs> yeah, periodically. Exactly. <laughs> Thumbs up. Doing great. I love you. No, that's terrible. <laughs> no, it's, no, no. We're all parents here. It's, it's a really good strategy I'm taking at home, actually. Thank you. That's You're a welcome. good one. It's a keeper. So I think at this point it would be really great to hear some of your work. I feel so fortunate to have been introduced to your work this year, and I, I hope that everyone here who's unfamiliar with it, you're in for a treat. This is some really exciting stuff. So um, Jensen. Yeah. What are you going to read for us tonight? Uh, I'm going to read a story from, from my book. This is just the galley, so it's sort of um, deceptive. The book is not actually out. Um, the story is called To God Belongs What He Has Taken. The, the stories are all set in Sweden, um, where I lived for a long time, about six and a half, almost seven years, with my wife, who's Swedish, and um, our kids. And so I think in some ways, uh, now I'm going to like self-correct myself, when I said earlier that writing is not expression for me. In a lot of respects, writing this book was sort of coming to terms with my own kind of adopted Swedish cultural identity. We lived there so long that I speak the language with my wife at home. I have a Swedish passport, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the characters in this book are all Swedish. Um, the places and the settings are all Swedish. And so in some ways, this is like fiction has become a way for me to get close to that kind of cultural identity. Um, this story is about a woman and a man, so, uh, well, whatever. I'll just read it. Can't wait to hear. Yeah, thanks. To God belongs what he has taken. Marie buys her morning coffee at the convenience store on the corner of her block. One of the men who works there is named Ahmed. He is Iraqi. When he laughs, which he does often, his enormous belly shakes. She likes Ahmed. She's been buying her coffee from him since she's lived on this block, almost two years. In a week, the sale on her apartment, her first, will be final, and she and her daughter, Tuva, will move, into, move in with Lennart. Marie has been marking this change by counting down the days until she will no longer buy her coffee from Ahmed's store. Lennart's grandfather died two weeks ago, and Lennart inherited the big apartment on Kungsholmen. There was room for all of them. Sometimes, Lennart says he wants children of his own, but Marie isn't sure she wants to go through raising another child. Counting the years she was traveling and Lennart was abroad with work and they were not together, she and Lennart have been in love more or less for 15 years. It's a very cold Monday in April. She goes to the store to buy her coffee on her way to work. She purposefully av avoids the pastries aligned in neat rows in a glass case near the register. Her hands are cold and her fingers ache. She wraps her hand around the worn, 
the warm cup. There is a new man behind the counter whom she has not seen before. This new man is not as old, nor is he as fat as Ahmed. He does not have the same kind eyes or funny, toothy smile. Where is Ahmed? She asks the new man. You haven't heard, he says. No, she says. Ahmed died on Saturday, he says. To God belongs what he has taken. He points to his chest. Heart attack. Marie touches her fingertips to her throat. Oh no, she says, I'm so sorry. Just above the man's left nipple, the outline of which she can see very clearly beneath his shiny red shirt, he is wearing a name tag that reads Ahmed. Below that, the name of the store curls in tight embroidered circles. This must be Ahmed's son, she thinks. Were you, she says, I mean, are you related to him? I'm so sorry, she says, before he can answer. No, 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 the new Ahmed says, I only work here. He smiles, Marie smiles back. Then the man turns serious. He appreciated all his customers, he says. It's a strange thing to say, and the way he sounds it sounds, says it sounds rehearsed and stiff. I liked him too, Marie says. She tries to pay for her coffee, but Ahmed puts his hands palm down on the counter. I thank you, he says. The doorbell jingles, and a new customer enters the store. It's another regular, a woman Marie recognizes. Marie is struck by a sentimental jolt. He's dead, she nearly says, nearly takes the woman by the arm. He's gone. It's the sort of tidy, packaged emotion one sees on television or in films, nothing more than a suggestion of real emotion. The feeling darts through her and passes quickly. Marie sees the woman daily at the store, and they often take the same train into the city. The woman gets off one stop before Marie at Udenplan. She's never talked to the woman, though once they sat across from each other on the metro and shared a smile when a young man sitting next to Marie said loudly into his telephone in a voice almost spilling over into a sob, I don't want to fuck you and forget about you either. Marie also sees the woman some e evenings at the park near the shopping center where the woman often comes with a dog, a large one, a Great Dane, Marie thinks, that trots along obediently behind the woman. She has seen the woman buying cards and flowers at the florist in a square close to the metro station. She's never seen the woman with a man or another woman for that matter, but she has seen the woman arm in arm with a much older woman at the pharmacist, at Sistembolaget, at the post office, once at the supermarket. Marie has imagined a life for the woman, of course. Aging mother, no children, good job, civil servant perhaps. She travels frequently to places Marie has always wanted to visit, countries that are warm in winter, Chile, Vietnam, or Papua New Guinea. She is standing in the way of a third customer who she sees as she follows Ahmed's gentle nod is trying to pay for a bottle of water. Excuse me, this third customer says. Sorry, he says, and pushes politely past Marie to the counter. Perhaps they even look alike, this woman and Marie. Marie watches the woman at the coffee station. The woman turns to retrieve the milk from the cooler. In profile, they are different. The woman is far more delicate faced than Marie is. She is taller, broader across the shoulders. But even in the coat she is wearing, obviously thin, thinner than Marie. The woman is pretty, and in spite of herself, Marie feels a little embarrassed to compare herself to the woman. The third customer takes his change from Ahmed. He stiffly places the bills in his wallet and the coins in the coin pocket on the front of his wallet. By the time he has finished this, the woman has approached the register to pay for her coffee. The train Marie has planned to take leaves in 10 minutes. It's an easy walk to the station, and she prefers to wait here where she can shorten her time spent in the cold. The outdoor platform is raised, and the wind, directed by rows of tall apartment blocks on either side, whips and stings its way from one end of the platform to the other. Marie moves close to the door, but does not leave. Outside, there is still ice and a thin dusting of snow in the shadows. She's going to miss this neighborhood. It's been good to her and to her daughter. Her father thinks she's making a poor decision moving in with Lennart. She's crazy to sell her place and get out of the real estate market. Every time they speak, he tells her this. Reinvest whatever money you make on the sale in a new apartment. Otherwise, the taxes will wipe out whatever profits you may have made. It's silly to work so hard for something and then give it up just like that. He often frames his concerns for her personal life in economic terms. In truth, she appreciates his advice, though she tells him as often as he offers it that she is old enough to make her own decisions. This is what she is supposed to say, and so it is what she says, though she, wish it, though she wishes she more often did what she wanted rather than what was expected. Marie hears the woman say, I'm sorry to hear that. Ahmed was a sweet man. 
He appreciated all of his customers, Ahmed says, and as he did with Marie, refuses to take the woman's money. As the woman passes Marie, they share a crisp smile. Marie steps out into the bitterly cold morning after the woman. It's a bright, clear day, a winter day, even though it is already spring. Marie slows her pace to follow the woman. There is a fast-moving line at the turnstile, and they arrive at the same time. Marie indicates with a hand that the woman should go ahead. On the platform, the woman retrieves a metro newspaper from the vending machine and continues down the platform until she stops near the midpoint. It's crowded here in the mornings at the middle of the train and not ordinarily where Marie waits for the train. Today she does. The woman unfolds the paper and begins to read. The paper shakes in the wind, the top of the pages folding over her hand. She tries to snap it back into shape but finally gives up and tucks the paper tightly between two slats on a wooden bench. That was very tragic, Marie says, surprising herself. She wants to introduce herself to the woman, lay bare the wonder between them, the way their lives have orbited so closely for so long, and now, tragically but not overwhelmingly so, they have met here at the occasion of the death of such a kind man. This is something they share. She wants to talk with the woman, ask about what sort of life, if any, the woman might have imagined for her. Would the woman have conjured up Leonard or Tuve by some indefinable ability to see patterns and cause and reason where there may be none? Would she have guessed at any of the details of Marie's life? How much of another's life can we rightly assume when we see it only in passing bursts? The woman looks at Marie and it occurs to Marie that the woman does not know that Marie has also been told about Ahmed's death and also that she may assume that Marie was referring to the newspaper and the wind and the paper's current place on the wooden bench. I'm sorry, the woman says. Ahmed, Marie says, the man who owns the shop, he died. Right, the woman says. Marie feels her disappointment in the woman's lack of sadness plainly in her chest. It's a hollow feeling, not physical exactly, but tightly woven inside her body. I was sorry to hear that. Do you know how he died? Marie hesitates, brightens at the opportunity of the woman's question. Heart attack, she says a little too hopefully, and takes a step closer to the woman. That's terrible, the woman says. He can't have been very old. To God belongs what he has taken, says Marie. I suppose, says the woman, blinking. I guess I don't know what that means. Marie picks up the woman's newspaper and puts it in her purse. She does this loudly, deliberately. The woman looks at her. I've seen you, Marie says. She feels her face flush with embarrassment but cannot control herself. I beg your pardon, the woman says. With your mother, Marie says. I've seen you with your mother. That woman, is that your mother? Once, when Marie was a child, she pinched her sister as hard as she could until her sister began to cry. The woman looks at Marie with a strange expression, turns her body to face Marie and says, my aunt, actually. She looks like you, Marie says, or you, her, rather. The woman stares at Marie. In the woman's face, Marie can see as clearly as if the woman has spoken the words out loud that the woman is scared of her. Marie smiles at the woman and turns away from her. This is the polite thing to do, she thinks, the proper thing. A man pushing a baby carriage is pacing back and forth along the platform. He has passed twice already. The baby is crying and the man is obviously nervous about this. He stops, not far from Marie, and puts a hand in the carriage, firmly rocking the baby side to side. Shh, he says, there's nothing wrong, be quiet. The baby is not crying loudly, and with the wind and the murmur of conversation and the static of the approaching train, it is hardly possible to hear the baby at all. Thanks. <clears throat> Jensen, thank you. That was great. Thanks. Um, I think what's really interesting in, in that story and in some of the other stories I've read is that you have a, a character in a very short period of time, very much reality is right there, like this is how these very yeah. cleanly defined details, mm -hmm. and then there's this huge world going on in their mind at the same time that we're, we're getting a glimpse of. How do you, like, as you're writing that, how do you choose you know, what you're showing and when, how you set that pace? It's a really interesting storytelling technique. <laughs> Thanks, that's a good question. Um, you know, stories have to deal with time, like that's just, that's a necessity of fiction writing. Um, and generally this is accomplished by compressing time, right, it's very rare. I, I was thinking about this today, I don't think I can think of an example where this is true, where story time corresponds exactly to real time. Um, and I think one of the ways that fiction like 
deals with that necessity of having to compress time is dipping into the character's thoughts and, and, and what's going on. So honestly, it's really not so much, I mean, it's deliberate, of course, because I'm writing the story and I'm composing it and I'm revising and I'm getting to things that I think are interesting and touching on anxieties and fears and desires and so on that the characters have that speak to the kind of messy inner <coughs> workings of the story. Um, but it also just sort of happens by naturally because the stories have to have to do that. Um, yeah, that's not. I don't know if that's an answer really, but well, like there's moments where you cut away. You know, she's yeah. she's thinking, and then all of a sudden the woman cuts in and says, "I'm sorry, I didn't know." Right. Or and you know, it's like she's brought back to her moment, and we're brought back with her. And yeah, and you, it seems like a very deliberate choice of the moment when we're brought back. I think it's kind of a, I think it's sort of a fine balance. I think it's a matter of, if you stay too long in a character's head, I mean, I hate to be sort of like, be full of aphorisms. My students <laughs> would tell you that I am, but like, it, it can be really boring if you just stay too far in the head. And also if you just sort of skitter along in the narrative present of the story where there's gesture and action and so on, that could likewise be sort of boring. So to me, it's a matter of trying to find some kind of balance and, and some sort of like, artfulness that will allow a sort of, kind of, I keep saying sort of, but like a, a, a porous boundary between gesture and action and then what's underneath the surface of the story in that, in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and it does. And, it, and it's sort of my, my other question I had for you about this is related to that. I think that there's a way that um, there's stuff that's not said. Yeah. There's, there's things that are left out that seem, that are really interesting. Um, how do you make? How are you thinking about that process of what you don't share of their thinking, or the baby at the end, and where we're left at the end of the story? Right. Um, well, so there's a writer, Charles Baxter, who um, I know we both are fans of, uh, who has a really wonderful craft book. Gray Wolf, my publisher, puts out this series of craft books, The Art of, and then fill in the blank. And this one is The Art of Subtext. And I was just teaching mm -hmm. an essay um, out of this book last week called the digging the subterranean i think and he has this really nice metaphor for subtext that like plot the event of the story right the a b the you know the arc all that stuff the narrative present of the story the actual not the storiness of it but the plotting of it exists and you can think of it kind of as a bridge or like a, a chain link bridge across an abyss right and if you the characters at times and all, and then by extension then of course the reader um, peer into that abyss. And inside that abyss is the subtext, the messy, complicated, sort of unnameable, crazy stuff that's underneath the surface. And that to me is always more exciting than, I mean, it, not very much actually happens in the narrative present of this story. A woman goes and buys coffee and finds out that someone's died. And then she follows, really creepily, follows this other lady to the train station. They wait for the train and there's a baby crying. Like that's, that's not a story. That's, that's just a series of events that seem related to, to, them, to each other. There's some sense of causality. But what makes a story a story is the kind of the, the, the complex, messy, contradictory at times sort of stuff that's underneath the surface that sometimes is really difficult to name. Like you can't even name it at times. Um, if you were to ask me what this story is about, I'm not sure I could say. It's about some kind of um, messy, I don't know, crashing of her desires and her fears and her um, the things she longs for and the things that she's afraid of and the ways in which she sort of understands or misunderstands herself and her f romantic relationships and her kid and all sorts of stuff, right? It's just all of it sort of wound up together and you, you can't, because that's how life is, that's how we all are, right? You can't, you can't untwist the stuff that's all wound up and that's what fiction does too, I think. It, it tries to render that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, so, Karen, mm. I think we'd like to hear some poetry. Now. Okay. What would you like to share with us? I'm going to read uh, three poems from my book. Um, I'll just read them straight through. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, not necessarily related to each other. And what is this book? This book is Landscape with Plywood Silhouettes. This is my my collection of poems. Okay. Um, I'll start with a poem called Becca. 
partway through the poem, it starts, there's some language that sounds like I'm speaking some foreign language all of a sudden out of the blue, and those are just some, it's a, um, an investigation into the etymology of a word, so I just list the words. That's why I'm doing that weird chanting thing in the middle. It's quite an introduction, right? I love it. Okay. Great. Can't wait. Um, it's not that exciting. The chanting part's not that exciting. Becca. She says, it's my birthday. I'm going tomorrow. What's your favorite font? What should I have him write? Serifs, I say. I like serifs. I like old typewriters, the keys, little platters. I don't answer the question about what to write. The vellum of her back. I am not her mother who later weeps at the words written between her shoulders. I get ready to retract the idea of serifs, the penance that pull the eye from one word forward, but the eye loves a serif. When we handwrite, we stop to add them to I. Read this word like typeface, make me always published, I am always a text. Write this on your back, I want to say. Write that you are a lyric and flying, serifed, syntactical. Becca chooses, make of my life a few wild stanzas. She lies on the bed while the artist marks her back, his needle the harrow for her sentence. Make of my life a place to stand, stopping places, a series of rooms, stances, staure, stanchia, stay. She has shown him a word she wants, a bird she wants perched above the final word, stanza. It is a barn swallow, ink blue flash. He says toward the end, so she can know it will hurt to ink so much blue. I am filling in the stanza now and he stings her right shoulder again and again, filling the room of the bird. Make of my life a poem, she asks me and him and her mother as she walks away. Make of my life something wild, she says. I watch her strike out across number 10 pond, the tattoo flashing with each stroke, and there is barely enough time to read it. This is Elegy for some Beach Houses. The break off Chatham broke and spilled old homes into the sea. Just spilled them like dresser drawers pulled out too far. Quiet under things sent flailing like old aunts into the surf. Just seaside, just at the beach, just where the generations had combed for jingle shells, whelks, the unrecognizable bones of fish. Just there, the houses tumbled like only a house can, full of argument, debris, and leftovers. Just there, the houses groaned like only a house can, full of mouse shit, must, armoires, and settees, full of lobster trap coffee tables, old letters, tattered rugs. First, the buckle of underpinnings, then the hip bone joists, the planks, the studs. The walls sighed like pages wanting to turn, illustrated with photos of old dogs, children, words like beach, happiness, family, painted on shingles. There was tipping and buckling and the keening of nails pulling out. A roof wanted to slide whole into the sea, but failed, the ridge pole splintering. Its backbone broken and all the bits finished, the houses were quiet. The old china floated a bit, small boats, Newspapers, books drifted. Daily trappings went down fast. Some lamps, buckets, deck chairs. This is not to mention all that sinks right off. A watch, jewelry left on the sill. The fish looked as curiously as fish can look. Bumped cold noses against dolls, mirrors, dish towels like seaweed in the dusted light, turned sideways, finned off. Little housed mollusks made no notice. The ocean settled and breathed. Wave, wave, wave. Mm -hmm. And there's a place in um, Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. Anybody know that already? Anybody? Okay. This is at the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. It's actually called at the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. After taking a series of self-portraits with a 1930s incinerator, which was covered with lichen and spiders and rust, 
a series of close-ups of the coin-operated viewfinder, step up and turn to clear vision, I took a series of portraits of myself with the bronze 1930s CCC worker who was looking off into the middle distance, wherever that is, and looking a little long-suffering. I sidled up, and in much the same manner that I take all my shots of myself, trying to catch myself unawares, mid-expression, I tried to catch myself and the statue in a moment of intimacy. I snaked my arm around his neck, my hand casual against his collarbone, and looked off. We looked together into the middle distance, into the air bowl of sky that is the canyon's yawn. Then I leaned toward him so that my head rested on his shoulder. Then I nuzzled in for real there on the constructed walkway mid-trail at the edge of the canyon, even my dog looking askance at us. I stood there until the people stopped staring, until the weather burnished my skin that same sun brown, until my dog walked away with the young girl who had asked so nicely, so much earlier, to pet him, until all I could think was how I wanted to look into his eyes forever, despite his pupils being awkwardly cast like two small fingerprints, as if someone once tried to reach inside them, how I wanted to brush his cheek with the backs of my fingers in the dark, where no one can see me cry, and some twist of metal in my chest is tightening, and I can feel it shiver, how I would never be able to, turned to bronze like this, stuck out in the various weather, him caught mid-kiss with the top of my head, stuck there like that, how I would stand like this forever, caught in the act of desire, frozen before reaching or speaking, how I got in the end what I had always been after. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. Thank you. I um I love how visual your poems are. As as I read one, you know the images are sort of firing in my brain, um, and I wonder, you know, and I and I'm I'm a visual person. I'm a visual artist, so it's sort of a natural thing. But I wonder, as a poet, how how are these words coming together? And I think your first poem, Becca, is actually a great example. It's very visual, but you also play with words. Mm -hmm. And you have this wordplay you're doing there. And um, are you choosing the images first or the words first? Uh, the, that first draft, when you first start to put it together, how does it start? Well, I think sometimes there's a mix that I really love words. I really, and I have a habit of collecting them. And I sometimes keep lists of, oh, that's a great word. And not like big fancy SAT multisyllabic words, but just simple words. Um, I want to use that word. I can't, don't ask me to come up with one because I can't right oh, now. Oh, man, yeah, I was going to really ask No, I'll think about it, I'll think about it. <laughs> but I, I like words, and I like words that have a lot of good consonant sound in them. Yeah. Um, and so I have a great old uh, thesaurus from 1912 that I love that it has strange expressions in it. So I like, mm. I'm attracted to language and sound. Um, but I think, I, I, Right now, I'm thinking a lot about this weird image that I want to use in a story. It's funny you should ask, in a poem, not a story, I don't write stories. Uh, I don't know how to write stories. <laughs> it's just, just writing I don't off get on it. <laughs> um, but I think of something, and sometimes instead of, if a, a story comes to me to use, I don't think, like I hit a deer hmm. not long ago with my car and I killed it. And I don't think I'm going to write a poem about that story. Yeah. I think, how can I use that deer? Right? Like, how can I demote the story into an image? And how can I use it inside a poem? Mm -hmm. And so I often think of a story and then demote it into a crystallized image. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I think a lot about image. But I think of, of life as a series of images that are associated with each other, not necessarily connected. And sometimes I like it when they have friction against each other. Hmm. I like deciding I want to have these two things in a poem, and I don't know how they're going to go together, but I'm going to play with it. I'm going to figure it out. So right now, I'm, I've been thinking about this weird news story, for instance, um, about silent discos. And in Switzerland, they've banned the silent disco because it's too annoying, because the people, so a silent disco, you have headphones in your head, and you're dancing to music only you can hear, right? You all know what this is. I had, I had no idea what this was. But they're banning them because they're too noisy, because people can't help but sing. 
right? So you have like hundreds of people like singing awfully while they're dancing. And like, I think that's beautiful. I think that's so amazing. Like a poem should end with that. Yeah. So, right, so I'm thinking now, like, okay, and so I, I walk around and I think, is that how, is that the poem that that should end? No, not that poem. And so I'm trying to figure out what, is it a love poem that ends like that? Is it a political poem that ends like that? Like, mm. what's it for? Am I answering your question yeah. anymore? Okay. Yeah, no, So I think really of images as coming from stories and then being useful to tell something different. Yeah. So, okay, so that's another piece I wondered about is that, you know, a story a storyteller is sort of beholden to the narrative in mm. some way you have to, you have to have a narrative however you do it but in a poem you're you're freed from that um, right and and you've got this especially when thinking about it, is the what happens next part and you don't have to have a necessarily a what happens next right but if you don't have that what do you have in place of it that moves the poem forward that's a great question Rubber bands. <laughs> um, well, so a narrative is a is like you talked about plotting. It's the sequencing of events, right? So if yeah. I say narrate what happened to you last night, you're going to say, well, this and then this and then this. So it's like a sequence. Even though fiction isn't bound to that sequencing and that order, the idea of narrative is I'm going to tell you a story where things happen, and the story is the culmination of things happening. I think is that fair? Yeah. So, so there's narrative poetry that does that. And I chose poems because this is called Storycraft that have narrative as a primary element. Mm -hmm. But a lyric poem, like I like to write a lyric poems. And so a lyric poem is more thinking like, if, I, if you said to me, narrate what happened to you, and I said, I was really scared. And I started to talk about being really scared. That's like what a lyric poem is doing. But it uses the details to give you the feeling of I was really scared. Um, the poem Elegy for Some Beach Houses is about families falling apart, mm -hmm. but it uses a story of houses falling apart to scratch at that scab of families falling apart. Mm -hmm. So I think that narrative is in service to the feeling. Whatever you're using of a narrative nature is trying to evoke a feeling. So I think I. For me as a poet, I'm not a narrative poet, even though I like story. I'm more concerned with what am I building in the emotional landscape. Emotional landscape. Yeah. And, and Jensen, how do you feel like that relates to, to your stories? Yeah, I think it resonates really well, actually, with the way I like to think about fiction, too. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 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 As you were saying, the thing about, about the plotting and like the, the subtext, that the, yeah. everything the story is for is for what, yeah. are you, what are you scratching at? Yeah, you know, I think, absolutely. Yeah. And I was thinking when you were talking about how in schools, so I'm a teacher, you're a teacher, mm -hmm. we ask kids answers to questions about literature. We ask them, well, what's the answer? Well, not we, but I mean, right. in theory, right. that happens in classrooms. And that's almost not the point. Right? <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> right? You didn't write that story for there to be questions that you could answer about it. No, yeah, right? no, yeah, exactly, that's exactly there, it's right. It's unanswerable, like, I don't know. Yeah, it is, it's totally right. unanswerable. It's, it, I like this, yeah. I, I really like the image of the scab that you're scratching at, that's so yeah. good, that's like, it's that's gross. what it is. It's so gross. It's so gross. <laughs> but it's so perfect, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, well, and you know, a lot of times you get those book club books where at the back there's a bunch of questions, yeah, and it puts is. me right back in oh, school yeah. where it's like, what was the metaphor of the galoshes about? And I'm like, I don't know, I, don't, I just like the book. And it, you know, the scab, much, much deeper, much more of something to, to yeah. linger on when you're yeah. finished with a book than a list of questions. I think it's more useful to ask young people or readers, um, how was the story built? Mm -hmm. Like if I want to read, mm -hmm. if I want to understand Jensen's stories, I might say, well, how are they built? Like, what's the framing like? How did it, how did he do it? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that is maybe even more instructive than what was the meaning of the name tag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. I, I'm teaching this play in a class, Hedda Gobbler, the Ibsen play, if any of you have ever read or seen it performed. And it's a really terrific play, and we were talking about symbol and image in, in class this morning. And the students were like, they, they could intuit in the stage direction and then the actual action and dialogue of the play that like the stuff in the play was important, but they were really frustrated that they couldn't figure out what it was meant to, what does the bonnet mean? What does the, par what does the parasol mean? Certainly the, when the guns come along, you're like, oh, I know what those mean. <laughs> um, but 
I don't, sometimes they're just the thing, right? It's just a, a bonnet, that it, and it's just good scene work when you put it in a story or in a poem. It's just an image. But also those things like have that power to do this, the scab scratching. Okay. And it's sort, of, it's sort of like big M myster mysterious, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of magical in a way. If you just get the stuff right, if you just have something to hang <laughs> those abstractions on, they're there, and it like can speak to the, to the story or to the, what the story is about or the poem or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great that you're both teachers and you work with students. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to give some advice now. Okay. Uh, what, <laughs> to, to new writers, returning writers, young writers, people who are getting started writing for whatever reason, what, what is something you think was really useful for them to know? What's something you wish you had known when you started <laughs> writing, maybe? Okay. Um, I think it's really important to have critical friends, right? So critical that they're important to your writing life, that they're critical to you, but mm. that they're also critical of you, mm -hmm. and that they know your body of work, and they know what you do, and they can call you on your stuff. They can say, oh, you're doing that easy thing again. You're doing the thing you always do. Cut it out. Or this is something new. Or someone who, who knows you um, and, and can give you some kind of a, um, a mirror for yourself. And a writing group can yeah. do that. Absolutely. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. one piece of advice. Community, I think, is important. Finding writers group, Burlington Writers Workshop, that mm -hmm. Karen and I have both taught with is a really wonderful resource in that mm -hmm. respect. Um, when I was a young writer, it was I found that on the internet um, through various online workshops and then publishing in, in small little magazines that were really just like you know, one dude in his basement like wanting to publish jokes on, online. <laughs> <laughs> I was I like, one, I my, my people. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it's like re reaching out and being sort of unafraid and then also not like not listening to people that you don't trust tell you that something's not good. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a, a, lot of, a lot of teaching is framed in like this is, oh, this is valuable or this isn't valuable because I, li I, don't, I like it or I don't like it. And that's nonsense. Like write what you want to write. Who cares? Mm -hmm. There should be more words and poems and stories in the world, not, not fewer. Um, that's what I think. I think you should just trust yourself and, yeah. yeah. I would say a thing about rejection, mm -hmm. you know, because I think part of everybody, like one piece of advice I like is that rejection doesn't mean anything necessarily. It's a numbers game, and um, they say on Duotrope, if you have better than eight percent acceptance rate, you're doing better than most people. Yeah, that's wow. right. 8%. That's eight <laughs> percent, right? So that's how many poems? A hundred out, eight getting in somewhere. That's ninety-two rejections. I'm not a math person, but I think yeah. that's right. That's a lot, um, <laughs> and. And so and I, I was working this last semester in the, the a mentor program with AWP, and I was working with this woman, and, and she was just kept getting rejected, 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 like 100 rejections. She was like, I quit. I'm terrible. And then she submitted her manuscript, and it was taken the next morning by a press. So, wow. you know, it's just it's, it's, it's happenstance. It's a numbers game. It's a game. Mm -hmm. And it's not the work, right? It's not, Absolutely. It's not the work itself. Absolutely. So. Well, Jensen Beach and Karen McCadden, it was so great to have you here today. This was a really inspiring and thought-provoking conversation. Thanks very much. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. it was fun. Thanks. I love it. Thank you. So um, this is StoryCraft. For more information about StoryCraft, go to retn.org slash StoryCraft. I'm Jen Ferrara. Thanks for being here tonight. Everybody.